ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Welcome online. Welcome to those who are here. Um, we are in a new month, the month of February. And so we're going to be, we're still in the book of Genesis. And uh, so we'll be getting some things. So I'm going to pray, open this up, and then we're going to dig and jump right in. So if you don't mind, let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you. We praise you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And not just study, God, we pray that we are able to meditate upon it and have it transform our very lives. So, God, through this lesson, uh, just reveal who you are, reveal your faithfulness to us, God, uh, as we see ourselves, and we're so thankful for who you are. And so we just submit this time to you to get all the glory and honor, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Month of February, we are going to be covering chapters 21 through 36. 21 through 36, we're going to be looking at God's faithfulness and man's dysfunction. God's faithfulness and man, when I say dysfunction, sin. It's just, just the sinfulness. And what you're going to find is, is that it is the sin that runs through God's own family that he has set aside. We'll see a lot of messed up people, uh, but yet God's still faithful uh, in the midst of that. And so that's what we're going to be covering this month. Um, now, our, tonight, we're going to be covering chapters 21 through 23, and our theme is promise fulfillment and providence. Promise fulfillment and providence. We're going to see God fulfilling his promise. We'll see his sovereignty, his providence, right? How things just happen, right? Yeah, they don't just happen. It is by God's providence that things take place the way they do. And so that's what we're going to be looking at um, for tonight's lesson. So, chapter, so hopefully you read 21. We're not going to read all of it. Uh, we'll read a few just minor selections, but I hope you, that you read it. A lot of it, we're in a familiar section. So most, some of this you probably have read before. So if you will, turn to chapter 21. Chapter 21. Um, and if I can get someone that would read uh, verses 1 and 2. Just 1 and 2 for us uh, in chapter 21 of Genesis. The Lord was gracious to her as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and the Lord's son and his old age at the very time God had promised. All right, all right. The Lord came. Um, Sarah, we know, was previously barren, right? She gives birth, birth to Isaac, right? That's a fulfillment. That's the fulfilling of God's promise to Abraham, right? It's a fulfillment, just as he said in their old age. She gives birth to, uh, birth to Isaac. And so the birth of Isaac really demonstrates the fulfillment of God's promise. God even said when he showed up, he said, by this time next year, right? Sarah laughed, <laughs> but that, it doesn't matter. God fulfilled his promise. Child is here. So we see the birth as a fulfillment of God's promise. We also see it as a reward of patience, right? They were looking for to be the fathers of what? Many nations? Here comes uh, this promise of a child. And then after waiting, the child is here. So think about it. God promises things to us through his word. When they finally come, it is a blessing, reward of our patience to know that God he promises something. It may take a while, but guess what? It will come to pass. Right? It will come to pass. Yeah, Luke. Uh, Luke 21. He did Sarah, he promised this same as in Mary. God got God made Sarah pregnant, not Abraham. No, Abraham made a pregnant, but God enabled it. It was different than Mary, right? Okay, right. Different than Mary. Because when I read it, that's what I read, I said, okay. So yeah. it is different. Yeah. God is, Abraham did it, God made it possible. Okay. Possible, yes. Okay. Because being old Mary yeah. at that point, you know, physically. You would think it was impossible. With Mary's case, there was no man involved. <laughs> yeah. So totally, totally different from that. It was supernatural, right? 
my age, I was old enough to go for it. We're realizing now, not only is it fulfillment of God's promise, the reward of patience, but it's also a demonstration of God's power. Because that's the demonstration, right? You have someone who is well beyond the age, right? Well beyond the age of being able to give uh, birth to a child, yet God said it's going to happen. And it's through his power that he is enabled that. I think that's good for us to remember as we think about the promises and faithfulness of God, that he will fulfill it, right? But you need to be patient for it. And when he does it, it's going to be because of his power. Not because of us, not because of our ingenuity, but because we waited on the Lord. He promised he's going to do it. It may take a time, not always in our time. But when he does it, you're going to have to give him the glory and the credit because it's going to be through his power, right? It's going to be through his power. Now, when Isaac is weaned, Abraham holds a great feast. And Sarah asked Abraham to cast out Hagar and her son Ishmael. Why did Sarah want this done? Why did Sarah want to get them out of here? Yeah. 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 Interfere with the inheritance mm -hmm. of Isaac. There's another, there's another reason. What's the other one? Ishmael was mocking, laughing, mocking at Isaac. So those two things, time for them to go. Time, time for them to go. I think this is another demonstration of why uh, we look in the Bible, we, we say, well, God said that it's okay to have multiple wives and family. This is a demonstration that it's not. Though he may have permitted those things to happen, this is not his original. We saw it back in Genesis before the fall. One man, one woman. You add another person in the house, all kind of confusion and problem. Right? Yeah. So confusion and problem. So, so Abraham is distressed. He's got to send Hagar and his child away. But what does God promise? He reassures Ishmael. He reassures uh, Abraham that Ishmael will also become a great nation. Why would Ishmael become a great nation since he's not the promised son? What do you think? Why would Ishmael become a great nation? He's not the promised son. Right. Right. Because he is an offspring. And God promised, right, that the offspring, God made a promise to make Abraham's offspring a nation, a great nation. This he said a nation. <laughs> yes. He told at the first time he said he'll make it a nation. And we got to the second part. He's talking to each time. He said he tells uh hey, God, he's gonna make them a great nation. Yeah. At first he said nation, then he said make it a great nation. So But I think it just goes back to demonstrate that God is faithful to his to his promises despite our sinful actions. Right? God, we go in and we try to help God and we try to do stuff. We mess and make things, but God is still faithful to his word. So he said, your offspring are going to be a nation. Guess what? You know, had a spell. He's going to be enough. There's going to be some problems between yeah. these two nations, right. which is probably still going on. Uh, but yet, it still lets us know that God is faithful. He, he's, he's faithful despite what we do. Now, Abraham send, sends Hagar and Ishmael away with some provisions. They wander in the wilderness of Beersheba until their water runs out. Hagar puts Ishmael under a shrub and moves away because she doesn't want to see him die. And God hears Ishmael crying. God hears. How great is that? In our cries, in our pain, God hears. And not only does he hear, 
He sent an angel. He sent some help. So even today, God hears our cries. He hears in our pain and the things that we go through. And he sends aid. He sends help. So he sends an angel to comfort Hagar, promising again to make Ishmael into a great nation. And God opens Hagar's eyes to see a well. And they survive. Ishmael grows up in the wilderness, becomes a skilled archer. God could have very easily said, you know what, this was of your own making. You had this child. You know what? Think for yourself, right? God is so good. Aren't you glad that even when we mess up, we do all kind of crazy stuff? He still watches over us. He still sees about us. He still cares, right? Even sometimes in our in our disobedience, right? He's just still faithful. Although we face the consequences often of our sin, he's still faithful. And it's so good to see you. We see that here now. Something that the New Testament brings up that lets us know that Ishmael and Isaac have some direct implications for our faith. Right? So if you will, let me read Galatians if you want to turn to Galatians chapter 4. So Galatians 4, verses 21 through 31. Galatians 4, 21 through 31. Uh, look what Paul writes. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? Written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according to, uh, was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is enslaved with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Our two brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So that goes back to Ishmael mocking, ridiculing, right, uh, Isaac. Uh, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So Paul is writing that Ishmael and Isaac is an allegory for the law and grace. For the law and grace. So Hagar represents the old covenant. The old covenant, Hagar represents Mount Sinai. Hagar represents early or earthly Jerusalem under bondage. But what does Sarah represent? Freedom in Christ. New covenant, grace, heavenly Jerusalem, right? And Isaac represents children of promise, children of promise. So the issue before us is who are you like? Ishmael or Isaac? Depends on the day of the week. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we, yeah, because are you slave or are you free spiritually? Do you have a permanent place in God's family? And people can become truly free by becoming sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, not like other religions that keep you in bondage to rules and regulations to earn salvation. That's the difference. The law is do these things and you can be saved. But grace is, it's already been done for you. And therefore, if you believe, you are saved, right? So the question is, do we try to operate under the law? Sometimes we do. We fall back into performance mode. If I do these things, God will love me. If I come to church every Sunday, he'll give me some grace. If I help my neighbor out, 
right? He'll bless me, right? That's law. That's old covenant, right? Now, should we do those things? It's good things to do, but that's not, we're not doing them to try to motivate God to do something for us. It's law. But under grace, we do them because he's already blessed us. He's already saved us. He's already done so much for us. So how do we operate? We operate like Isaac being a child of promise. Or are we operating like we're under the law? Trying to earn God's favor and love represented by Ishmael. That is the question before us. And sometimes we do slip the bit on the day of the week, right? We gotta always remind ourselves we are of Isaac. Right. We are of the children of Abraham, the child of promise, right? Uh, not Ishmael. Right. Any, any questions, comments? In verses 22 to 34, we see Elimelech, his army commander, they visit Abraham. We're back, back in Genesis. They recognize God's blessing on Abraham, and they seek to make a covenant with him. So can someone read uh, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23? 22 and 23. Then I, a Bimelech, accompanied by Michael, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Swear to me by God here and now. Here now that you will not break an agreement with me or with my children and descendants, as I have been loyal to you, so you will be loyal to me and to the country where you are resident. So it's interesting. They want to make a treaty so that Abraham would not deal falsely with him. They knew that God was with Abraham, yet they also knew he was deceptive. How did they know these two things? How did they know that God was with Abraham, and yet they also know that we need to get a treaty because so you don't deal falsely with us? How do they know these two things? <laughs> yeah. So you remember back in chapter 20, right? Back in chapter 20, Abimelech took Sarah into his house because Abraham said what? My sister, right? Mm -hmm. So he takes Sarah in his house, but guess what happens? It causes the womb of everyone to be closed up in Abimelech's house, right? And God kept Abimelech. It actually says that if you go back to chapter 20. He kept Abimelech from sitting with Sarah um, and closed the womb of these women in his house. So he, you know, he knew that God is with Abraham, but he also knew maybe he lost. You think you you were deceptive in what you said, which caused us some headache, right? Yeah, bro, bro. Yeah, I think she was she, she is, so there's a little, but he was deceiving, right? That's the point. So he took a he took a partial truth and made a whole lie, right? <laughs> because his thing was, I don't want to get killed, right? So because I think you killed me to take your wife, and here's the thing, like man, that's your wife. And God is, God is punishing us because, uh, you know, you was uh, falsely, dealing falsely here. What does Abraham's character tell us about the nature of believers? What does Abraham's character that we just learned, we just talked about? How do you react when you're Christian? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Selfish. Right. Self-preservation. Right. Anybody else? Yeah. So we try to put believers on status. But in the day, that's what we feel. Also said something about his relationship with God. Did he really trust God? Mm. And so he went to the extreme because he wasn't in a place where he was really trusting God to protect him. And so we do that as well. Do we really try to, we, we, we're waiting on God and we think he's going to do something, but um, 
we put ourselves in a position where God isn't working fast enough, or can I trust you that you're going to do these things? Mm -hmm. And we react. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to see that throughout this book. That's my function, right? Is that we got to help God out. We got to do some stuff, right? <laughs> we got you're not moving fast enough, right? I heard what you said. I don't trust you. And Abraham, we can look at Abraham and point fingers at him, but every point, thing you point at him, just just point back at yourself. Right, because we are the same way, right? We this just points to reality that believers can sin too. And sometimes we waver, right? We get under pressure. So we lie to save our own skin, right? And, or we don't you're not moving fast enough, right? Um, but yet Abraham will turn around and have great faith, right? That's, isn't that us? Right? Well, even here he can take his son out and get the business. Yeah. It's a lot about a father, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sit him out. Get rid of because the wife is like, you need to get rid of that one. You put him straight away. Perverted. The point that Sally told him to take the table. He never stood up and said, you know, God has told us how to do We have to finish it. Right. It's just like Adam in the garden. Yeah. You know, can you say that? Yeah, is that is that or is this woman you gave me? <laughs> right? And they're passing the blame. Here he doesn't say, you know, he's probably like, look, I have too much problem. I don't need to have two wives up in the house. <laughs> Send one out, get rid of one. Right. So all these things happen um, because we like Abraham are flawed, right? Uh, so, so Tammy had put in uh, sometimes we try to figure things out on our own terms, right? Uh, Brother Rick, sometimes we like fear man, right? Absolutely. Even as believers, when you trust God and someone's in front of us, we can get fearful. No, we get fearful and, and turn on things. Uh, Tam put in there, he went into panic mode and made his own decision, right? <laughs> so I think this is Phoebe's comment is that sometimes people put believers up here and and we got to recognize that we are, although we're deemed believers, we're still sinners, saved by grace. We still have the uh, capability of sin. Yes. And what I want to say is that when you get to the you don't know what you like. Yeah. We use that example when you say that um, uh, dying for Christ, like somebody coming in and say, right. do you believe in Christ? And then they're going to shoot you. Are you going right. to respond? To don't really know when you're scared. People don't know what they're going to do. That's true. Under pressure, we hope that we're going to respond a certain way. When you face down a barrel of gun or something, right? So, at any, here's the thing as believers, we can say all the stuff we're not going to do. I would never do that. <laughs> but given the right circumstances, the right amount of pressure, any one of us are capable to do almost any sin, right? You think about the possible, um, think about. Oh, Peter. Peter. Yeah, Peter. Oh, man, no, I ain't never heard you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm right. We brought it down. He's with you. A little bit of pressure to come arrest him. <laughs> I mean, so overconfident, just thinking of how great he is, you know, the faith, I'm with you. But that that's us oftentimes under the right amount of pressure, circumstances. So we just got to recognize that and be real with other people. Too, right? But when people try to put believers and Christians recognize that, hey, we're a, we, we can sin just like, but the question is, what do we do afterward? Can we repent? Can we strive? Lord, help me in this area, right? If I'm struggling, right? So those are the things that make us different than just saying, well, this is how I am, right? No, I desire to do better. Lord, help me in that so that I won't fall into the same issues again, right? That's the case. So what stands out to me is, um, um, you know, the day of my funeral, do I, I want to be known for my faithfulness? So we, we read about Abraham's faithfulness to God, but it's an encouragement to know that, you know, there are some things in us that, you know, may not trust God in the instance of, but, you know, does my faithfulness stand out above my, yes. my flesh or my fault? Right, absolutely, absolutely. That's a great, you know, all right. Get your, get your eulogy ready now. Like, 
get, you know, live in such a way that um, preachers don't have to be stumbling. <laughs> Say right, uh, he may not be lying, but he, you know he want to be stumbling. Um, but absolutely right, because at the end of the day, Abraham's listed in Hebrews chapter eleven, and he's in the hall of faith. Because overall, even though we each will have times when we waver, um, there, there's something about his faith that he believed God and did quite a bit, and so that's what. Oftentimes, we want to be remembered by. So that's that's great. That's a great thing to keep. Yeah. I like that you said get your eulogy ready now because it really changes the, the, the dynamics of how you live your life and what will people say once you're gone. And it's not that we live for works, you know. But we're not doing this for works and to be glorified, but for God to get the glory. But am I living my life in a way that my legacy will see God's faithfulness in my life and how I trusted Him? And how I live through that. And so what will people say? You know, you go to some people are like, well, they were they were nice, they were good, but <laughs> but what else will people say about you right. when you're gone? And that how you touched other people's lives and how you stood for Christ and, and different things like that. Yeah. And, and you would hope that your life, especially you say you're a professing believer, the reflection yeah. of your relationship with God, right? Mm -hmm. A reflection of that. Such that there won't be that contradiction. Like, yeah, they were in the church for 20 years, but they were mean and they didn't forgive folks and, you know, lying all the time. Like, well, that doesn't reflect on that relationship with God. Makes you wonder, right? So, yes, we want to live in a way that ultimately the glory should go back to God at the end of our days, right? As people look over our life, we can see those things. But yeah, all of us have sometimes the inconsistencies and things that pop up, right? And Abraham's no different, right? And we're going to see none of these. These are the, what, what we call them, the, the fathers of <laughs> Yeah, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, they all had a lot of flaws, right? So they, no, I want to see the higher basis in that the thing that you do here, the happens of God, is great to see how it impacts the others that you need to hide. So, you know, it just keeps going on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, Abraham and Abimelech, they do make a covenant, right? Uh, and the place is called Beersheba, which means well of the old. Well of the old. All right. All right. So, turn over to chapter 22. Chapter 22. Somebody can read verses 1 and 2. Chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Yeah. All right, so now God is testing Abraham to sacrifice the promised son, the son that Abraham dearly loved. Can you imagine the thoughts that must have been bouncing around Abraham's mind on hearing this command? So, so I want us to think, if you were in Abraham's shoes, what questions would you have about God's request here? If you were in his shoes, what kind of questions would you have? So, uh, is that really you, God? Well, okay, all right, yeah. You're trying to... God, is this you, right? <laughs> Anybody else? Why? 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 Why do I do this, Lord? Right. Anyone else? Just my own stage. And why would we? Why would that even question may come up? What is it about Isaac that seems to say promise? This is the promise. You tell me not to kill him. Would that be one of the bigger ones, right? Any other questions would you have? Are you sure? All right, kind of questioning. I'm scared. I'm scared to go even do this, right? Right. Sarah, right. I gotta go face. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so there are so many questions. Here's some things that I wrote that 
How could God tell me to offer my son as a sacrifice? Is it not against God's law that forbids murder? I've got to sacrifice my own son, the son of my heart and my life. Would I not rather die myself than him? Why would God want such a thing? What about the promise? God, you promised and gave your word that Isaac was the promised son, that through his descendants, the promised seed would come, the savior of the world. If I sacrifice Isaac, how can all this happen? How can you fulfill your promise? So with the city. How can I ever face Sarah again? <laughs> or for that matter, face anyone? What about my testimony before the world? God did not like with child sacrifice. That was something the pagan gods would do. Mm-hmm. Particularly Molech. They would sacrifice children to, to, to the idol called Molech. Right? Wait a minute. God, this is not being different, right? God, sacrifice idols does not match your promise, right? Mm-hmm. I cannot reconcile all this in my mind. What do you mean? What are you after? What are you doing? Like, why are you doing this, right? Um, yeah, are you sure? George say, Are you sure, God? Sam is like, This sounds out, outside of God's character. Does that sound like you? But here's the thing. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just thinking, since you're only son, I'm like, I got more than one. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Why would God say that? Because he does have more than one son. Okay, it's a test. Look at it. Abraham's life, everything was kind of building up to this, like almost small little trials by God showing, are you going to trust me, Abraham? Are you going to trust me? Like all these little things. And then it starts to build up to this one big promise are you going to trust me that I am going to give you your son? Now that I did give you your son, I'm going to take for something. So it's almost like a, it's another test. Right. True. And also his only son, because the other son, Ishmael, is one that you manufactured. It's not the mm-hmm. one that I gave. So that's why he says your only son. All right. All right. Because Ishmael, Ishmael is not the promise to son. Isaac is. Or not the first to be the only son. I know. But here's the thing. I want you to know Abraham's question. His inability to resolve the problem in his mind did not keep Abraham from obeying God. Abraham obeyed God. He, he didn't understand. But nevertheless, he set about doing exactly what God told him to do. Not understanding the problem did not keep Abraham from obeying God. Abraham was committed to obeying God whether he understood the promise or not. So what has God told you to do that you don't understand? It's like an amazing pastor how this is the same Abraham went through all this questioning with God. He presupposed upon God that if he destroys Sodom and right, Gomorrah, right. destroys the righteous with the wicked. Yeah. I mean wicked with the righteous. Right. He's not just. Yeah. But now he's telling you to sacrifice your son. You don't say a word. You made a heart feel flee yeah. save. Wow, he spoke. Yeah, yeah. You've got the promise of yeah. you. You don't even say anything. He just okay. Yeah, go. Yeah. No question at all. Went out loud to God, right? Right. We're, we're sitting here going, well, I know what's going through my head. Potentially, it's probably going through his head, but but we also know that he did have some faith, right? But here's the thing: we have to trust God because of His nature, even when our situation makes no sense or is threatening. Right. We may not be able to reconcile all that's going on and how God's going to view our situation. Has anyone ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation where you don't know how this is going to work out, but you just have a promise that God said He would not leave you, He would not forsake you, that He all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose? I don't know, God, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to obey you. You will work these things out. I don't know how you're going to do it. This gives us to the point, y'all. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Brother? Mm-hmm. 
about it sometimes. So just as Abraham was being tested, think about lesson that Isaac learned in that season. So sometimes we go through things, yeah. not necessarily just for us, just for our test, but Absolutely. it's the the things that others see mm -hmm. and their experience, their witnessing, their learnings yeah. through our own journey. Absolutely. So, yeah. Another thing about uh, trusting Abraham trusted God. Mm -hmm. Isaac like was trusting Isaac. Yeah. And then he had to trust Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, like, I trust God, but then I got to trust. I got to trust with Dad. <laughs> And then you think at some point he recognizes because at first he's like, "Where's the sacrifice? I see the wood, but I don't see." It. Now by the time you t it lay me up on the yeah, on the wood, yeah. you should know. You still have the sacrifice, right? But yet he still didn't fight. He willingly lay down. <laughs> So Abraham believed that God would bring Isaac back to, and guess what? In a sense, he did, because Hebrews 11, 17 and 19, this is what it says. Right? This is him in the hall of faith, right? By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in fact an offering of his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead from which figuratively speaking he did receive him back right. so in a sense took him up there to kill him but god made a way for both of us to leave the mountain so he did receive him back right so abraham was at the point look if i kill him i know you're gonna raise him you have to you, you're gonna do something god because you made a promise and i'm trusting and i'm believing in you so since so y'all just want to get there, I know it's good, it's good. All right, so we'll take a little bit of activity. We're going to point out the ways that this event points to Jesus. So take just take a few moments now. Look over the passage again. And um, we're not going to do the rest of the Just look, look there, look, review it. I know you've seen it. But just look through it again. Try to think about where some of the ways in which this event points us to Jesus, right? You online too. Do the same kind of go through the rest of it in this chapter. Kind of look and say, all right, where do I see this pointing us to Jesus? Such a rich, some of you already jumped in, you already pointed out a few things. <laughs> Not if you said something like Isaac was supposed to be sacrificed, which may have been the foreshadowing of the one for all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Abraham the father is not gonna have you sacrifice your son. I'm gonna go ahead and sacrifice mine. Yes. Yes. So Abraham yeah, absolutely Abraham sacrifices or Abraham is to go and attempt to sacrifice what did he say? His only your only son. This is what God says to him, right? We know that that points us to the true one who did get sacrificed, right? And he is God's only, only begotten, one and only son, right? So we have to see Isaac being there in the sense of foreshadowing of Jesus, right? Yes. And you all come to your obedience. Obedience in how so? Yes. And he got up and he actually. Follow what his father said. Exactly. Not on that wood. That's it. That's it. That's it. The sons will be yeah. The sons will be. He could have revolted. He could have jumped away. But he says he willingly. What did Jesus do? 
went to the cross in obedience to the Father. What was his prayer in the garden? Not my will. Show will be there. Right? All right, all right. So one way up, talking about one way, Jesus is the way. I like that. I like that. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. All right. I'm looking at you. I think you're going ahead, but God mm -hmm. provides the ram. Yes. And blue of Isaac and the sacrifice just take Jesus in our land. Yes, absolutely. So get a substitute right All right so instead of now you sacrifice Isaac there's a substitute provided that points us to Jesus right because guess what he is our instead of God killing us he accepts a substitute right yeah we have some other a birth and then the third day <laughs> Yeah, third day. Yes. 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 The third day. I like that. Yeah, brother. Yeah. You know, when I was looking for the date, you know, to me that was what God said. God will provide the lamb for the girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so God provided his only son. Yes. For our sacrifice. Yes. You said right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. He provided that lamb was sacrifice. Right. Third day. Any others? Any others? Turn them up there. There's, there's a few more in there. <laughs> there's a few more in there. Yeah. Yeah. Christ was one. Yeah. I mean, that Abraham was going to slay Isaac with. He's got the spear that he is going to pull inside with. I mean, it all points to the yeah. Wood. Who's carrying the wood? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. So he stumbled, he carried his cross. Right. That's like, that's like you go out and get the switch to the switch. <laughs> Carry your own instrument of destruction. He yeah. carried his own wood to be burned up with. Yeah. yeah. The man was called the ticket. Uh -huh. Yeah. The man was in his heart in a ticket and a sword. By its head. Jesus wore a crown of thorns put upon his head. Absolutely. 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 One of the contrasts that I saw though was when Abraham was about to do it. It's like you're you're God saying no. Right. But when you see it, it's just like you do not hear no. It's like there's right. silence. Silence. Yes. 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 Heaven intervenes, but here heaven does it in Jesus' case, right? Because that's the whole purpose. No. So, yeah. Sure. He came into human history and did her name. And it was still a father and son. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good. You guys, yeah. I love it. I love it. Uh, let's see. What else? Did, did, did we get anything? I, I definitely had yeah, Abraham sacrificed his only son, promised son. God sacrificed his only begotten son. Isaac went willingly, right? Jesus went willingly to the cross and obedient to death. Abraham believed God would raise Isaac. God raised Jesus <laughs> from the dead, right? Isaac carried the wood of his sacrifice. Jesus carried the cross where he would hang. Ram was a substitute for Isaac. Jesus was our substitute on the cross. The ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head. They went up the mountain. Without Golgotha's hill. So that, again, so many what God would take this event, this real event, to foreshadow. This is what scripture calls uh, topology, right? Types of Christ, right? That, that, that events and people that foreshadow um, something of, of Jesus Christ, his nature, or something that happens to him, who, or who he is, right? And this, this one is chock full of. Theological uh, references to foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. But Pastor, would you even this may be a stretch? I was reading here when it said that um, 
stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So when Jesus went with the disciples that night, he told them to stay there and he was going to go pray. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he left the disciples behind and here. Abraham is leaving the servants behind to go. He said, worship. It ain't like they're really going to worship. You know, right. they're the symbolism of worship, but he went to talk to the father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's so many, that's the levels to just that event, right? To the walking away, the leaving, the going, going to the father to, for that purpose, right? Um, telling them to stay behind, you know, all, all of those things, I think, are just point us to Jesus, right? Point us to Christ, point us to the sacrifice. And uh, uh, just a quick question. Um, was that the same mountain that uh, Jesus was sacrificed on? It was the same one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It should it be the same. Temple Mount, yeah. Mount Moriah. Yeah, Mount Moriah. Yeah. Yeah. Almost to draw a conclusion that it was the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's another one. I was missing that one. I forgot about it. Yeah. Yeah, the same mountain where Jerusalem would end up being a little outside of the temple. Yeah, the temple would go. And it goes up to the same. It's like thousands of years before this happened, right? So this is a good point, right? Because oftentimes when we read scripture and we get to like points, uh, locations and stuff, we kind of gloss over it, you know. Um, there's some meaning behind why it's recorded. And sometimes you will see things like this. This place was important, right? So we got to pay attention to that, right? When we get into Joshua, there's a lot of places mentioned that you just want to read over, <laughs> but they're, they're important, right? Locations to, to understand. Now, what did Abraham call the place? The Lord will provide. The Lord will The Lord will provide. Yes, yes. That is. So the Hebrew name is Yahweh Yira or Jehovah Jireh. Right. The Lord will provide. And he has provided. He has provided um, provision of the ram. Right. Abraham looks up and he and there's a provision of the ram. And so this should strengthen our faith to know that the Lord will provide. The right thing at the right time, you know, at the right place. And as we point out, this event foreshadows how God provided the ultimate sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, for our sins. So, yes, he's a provider, right? And this is where we get Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh, Yerah, um, that we can Thank the Lord for his provision. And this is a better provision than just money and material mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yes, thank the Lord. God does bless in, in that way. But man, I, you can have a mansion, and but to have your sins for you. It's far more important <laughs> than having a lot of monetary stuff, right? Uh, so the Lord has provided. So you can look in your life, I know, and see. And if you're a Christian, Believer, well, yes, he's provided the greatest thing you need, and that was a substitute to die for your sins. And there are other ways he continues to provide for us throughout our years and throughout our lives. Yeah. Now, in verses 20 24, it reports uh, reports came that the family of Nahor, uh, Abraham's brother, was expanding. And among those who were born was Rebecca. Who's Rebecca? Anybody know? Yeah. Oh, not Jacob. Jacob's mother. Yeah, Jacob's mother. Isaac's actual wife. Future wife of Isaac. Right. So, a little tidbit is there. I'll let you know. Jacob and Esau's mother. mother. Yes. Yeah, so that's so that little point at the end of this chapter, right? That's like the little extra scene at the end of the Marvel movie to get you ready for the next, you know, yeah. to let you know what's coming, right? So, so Rebecca is born, right, to let us know uh, what's coming. All right, God keeps. I'm looking at yes. 
right, so chapter 23. Chapter 23, Sarah um, dies at the age of 127 uh, in Hebron. Abraham mourns her death and seeks to purchase a burial site right, for her. So he, he negotiates with the Hittites to buy a cave in the field as a burial place for Sarah. And Abraham insists on paying the full price for the cave in the field. He buys the land in the presence of the Hittites as a permanent possession and burial site for his family. I want you to see this chapter emphasizing the importance of this cave uh, as a significant burial place and it marks the beginning of Abraham's permanent ownership of the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. So he's coming in this land. This is what God has promised that he's going to take him into a land. And now we start to see him purchasing a uh, burial spot, land, and everything. This is all through God's promise, right? That you're going to have this land. Eventually, so this is to help you all know that when we start to get to when we get to Joshua, um, and you see all these folks living on land, and God say, you need to go get them off. Kill them. You understand, God promised them this land, right? And so, uh, so this is a nice little setup for what's, what's happening here, chapter 23. All right, very good, very good. All right, so let us enlighten in the words before for us. So first, just reflection, where have you seen God's faithfulness and providence in your life? And hopefully we could stay here for the rest of the night. Talk about where we've seen one God being faithful to us. And also, where have you seen his providence? Where he has done things that almost seem like happenstance, circumstances. No. Yeah. No. God's providence. Something just happens to happen that way, and it's God orchestrating and moving. So, where have you seen that in your life? Like, rejoice in that, reflect on that. You know, praise God for those times. And some action we want to read, chapters 24 through 27. The next time, so we'll go ahead and read those chapters. Um, and then I want you to make note of where man's dysfunction is seen. All right, so to get a big Take no point. <laughs> where do you where do you highlight it? Just just keep a trick kind of keep a track of where do you see this uh man's dysfunctional sinfulness being shown throughout you know uh, those chapters, right? All right. All right, any questions or comments before we get ready to close out for tonight? Well, hopefully you've seen um, you know, this fires we couldn't cover everything, obviously. Uh, but definitely go back, read, uh, reflect God's faithfulness, his promises coming through, his goodness, his provision, right? His providence to bring things at the right time. The Lord will provide, right? We do have wonderful Jehovah Jireh. He will provide for us. Uh, and we are trusted in that. Even when it doesn't seem to make sense, even when it seems like God's promises are taking a long time to happen. Trust him, right? Because if you said it, you're going to do it. So we believe him in that. So, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, but then, what, the first reflection question, I had already written something similar to that, but I have put more trusting in Christ after the Jesus. So you can see God's right. faithfulness and providence in both of those. Yeah. And one thing in that, you may even find that if you look at before he came to Christ, you mm -hmm. probably still see his faithfulness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, 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 in your disobedience and your rebellion against God, right? Uh, well, the Lord spared me. Some of y'all were doing some stuff, uh, you know, back in the day before Christ. So, <laughs> and, and you, you go, man, Lord, thank you. I didn't kill myself, right? His providence. And now you can look and recognize. Oh, thank you, Lord. I see your faithfulness and how I can much more trust you. And, but you were there even beforehand, right? That's before you even thought about him, how good and faithful he was, too. So I like that. I just reflect going before Christ and then after coming to Christ, 
how you can look back and see his faithfulness throughout your life. Well, let's pray. We will close out for tonight. All right, Father, we thank you. We do as we just marvel at your word. We see how you are faithful, faithful back then, and you're the same God today. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are provider. So we thank you for the provision of your son, Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate sacrifice, substitutionary atonement to die for our sins so that we might be spared and have eternal life. God, we are so thankful for that. So God, even when we fail to be faithful to you, we like Abraham can be sporadic at times. And, uh, sometimes we believe, sometimes we struggle with belief. Sometimes we are deceptive, and, and but God, we thank you that you're always faithful. You're faithful even when we are faithless. And so we praise you, thank you for that. Even as we leave this place, help us to continue to reflect upon your faithfulness, reflect upon how you are uh, providing your providence, your sovereignty in our lives so that our lives can be poured out as a reflection of your glory and so that others can give you the glory and the honor we pray. Uh, we thank you, we praise you until we gather again. We pray that your grace will be upon us. And so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> All right, don't forget, uh, we'll take a uh, few minutes and then we'll start taking some prayer requests. So if you have any prayer requests online, uh, go ahead and get those. Get ready to. Let's go.